kids are gonna get crazy! <laughs> Most everyone's mad <laughs> Hello, 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 folks! Welcome to Animat's Crazy Cartoon Cast, and I'm hoping you guys are having a great weekend so far, and that this start of July is going very well for you, and that you're taking advantage of the summertime, or at the very least, taking advantage as much as you can while, of course, staying safe. Hopefully, while you are going out and having your fun, that you're still practicing social distancing, wearing a mask, and all that kind of stuff. Oh, and of course, uh, washing your hands. That's always important. Now, for this week, though, I just gotta say that, man, I did not expect this, but I got a very strong feeling that this is going to be a very fun-filled episode. Oh man, the stories that I have for you, uh, there's a lot of surprises, but there's a lot of very fascinating things to go and talk about, which I believe will result in a really good and probably memorable episode as well. Not necessarily for something huge that's going to happen here, but just for the fun of it, you know what I mean? But anyways, before we do go and get things started, why don't we go and hear one more time from the sponsor of this episode of Animat's Crazy Cartoon Cast. Yes, I have mentioned uh, in the last episode that I do have a sponsor, but now we're going to be looking at them one more time, uh, which I am going to be talking about Never Ending. Yes, this episode of Animat's Crazy Cartoon Cast has, is uh, brought to you by Never Ending Bring Your Stories to Life. Now, of course, many of you are probably familiar with it by now, considering that I did talk about it last week. But in case you need a little bit of a reminder, let me go and read it directly on the Kickstarter. Which, by the way, yes, uh, this is a project that is currently on Kickstarter right now, and they are going to need your help. And uh, just to read you a little bit over here, uh, the synopsis of what it's trying to say is that NeverEnding is a web-based tool that comes with a library of customizable art. Using NeverEnding, you can quickly and easily create custom images of your characters in different poses and a variety of armors, weapons, and items. Build scenes with those characters by adding a background, props, creatures, and other characters. And add animated GIFs of props and spells and even pre-programmed animations to turn Turn your scenes into cool animated videos. So this is basically an animation software for beginners. Like if you want to go and take your first steps into animation uh, that is a little bit outside of uh, like doing the actual things like the bouncing balls and the walk cycles and stuff like that, then this is a great tool to go and start with. Uh, which by the way, on a side note, I'd like to mention that this all has a theme of uh, medieval fantasy. Think about stuff like World of Warcraft and Dungeons and Dragons. It's a little bit like that. So you'll be able to go and cu uh, customize your characters however you want with it. Uh, in fact, I would recommend this as a great tool to learn how to use um, character design, like to understand character designs and also to understand uh, a bit of cinematography, uh, maybe storyboarding, if you will, in order to know how your scenes can work out, like how to map out your scenes for animation so this is your first this could be like your first steps to understand a little bit about the process of animation before going into like really into the big ones like um Maybe start off with Never Ending before you would go and jump into something like uh, Adobe Animate or even uh, Toon Boom Harmony. Uh, but as I said before, though, this is a Kickstarter, and right now they only have about a week, so it's only a limited time if you want to go and support them. And uh, they're not necessarily that far off from their goal because uh, they're looking for $17,300 in U.S. currency, and right now they're almost at uh, 12000 so they only need $5,500 more. So if you want to go and uh, support NeverEnding, if you are interested in uh, trying them out and support them, then all you have to do is go to Kickstarter and look for NeverEnding Bring Your Stories to Life. 
All right, so enough of the sponsorship now. Now it is time that we need to bring this story to life, to bring this episode to life. So I would like to go and ask the chat wall, are you all ready for today's episode of Animat's Crazy Cartoon Cast? Are you ready? Let me hear it, folks. Is it time that we go and get things started right now? You're the one who needs to answer, so let me hear it. Let's see. Yes, yes, they're ready. That's perfect. That's great. All right, now everybody's ready. Now we shall go and get things started and with our first story that we have right now we're gonna go and talk about a certain streaming service that we didn't really talk a lot about here something that you might have heard of but i barely talked about it in this uh podcast in particular and what i'm talking about is queeby now maybe you're familiar with queeby maybe you're not maybe you have it maybe you don't but um the significance with queeby is that this is one of the few streaming services that is actually not owned by a major studio. But instead, this is actually the streaming service of Jeffrey Katzenberg, which you guys may know as uh, one of the guys responsible for the Disney renaissance for bringing us films like The Little Mermaid, uh, Beauty and the Beast, uh, Aladdin, The Lion King, and all that kind of stuff. And Jeffrey Katzenberg, of course, you may know him the most as the founder of DreamWorks Animation, which would go on to give us films such as Shrek, Madagascar, Kung Fu Panda, How to Train Your Dragon, and so much more. So you would think with Jeffrey Katzenberg's streaming service that there would be a good amount of animation content, or if there would be animation content, then it would be real good. But we haven't really heard much from it until recently, actually, when there was one animated series that finally released a trailer. So with that said, we're going to start things off by looking into this particular trailer and start off by looking into your daily horoscope actually let me just go back i'll just close this off whoops uh you're not supposed to see that <laughs> all right anyways let's go ahead and check out your daily horoscope in three two one go libra you really know about avocado toast well yeah duh that's important hey does anyone happen to know how a bill gets passed in the senate i have no idea Virgo, whatever that horoscope is saying, if it's disagreeing with me, it's bullshit. Life, love, work. Wait, is that your horoscope? Yeah, is it telling you not to do this? If they're dead, they should at least let me know. I gotta quit stand-up. It's Leo season, bitches! I'm an empath. I'm quirky and adorable. Scorpio thinks I'm not chill. I am the most chill. Decidedly less chill. I didn't go to your event because I did not want to. I need a suitcase of rosé and a roller bag of Thin Mints. Someone make a meme out of my face. Did anyone hear that? Here, can we go in the hallway? I want to say it again in front of people. If I did drive an eco-friendly car, it would be a Tesla. The expensive one, not the peasant one. The stars told me that I need to be more real. Yeah, but the stars have never been ghosted. When the horoscope says you gotta sleep, you gotta sleep. Wow, wonder how that'll play out. <laughs> and you get an invitation, and you get an invitation, and everybody gets an invitation! So, yeah. That was your daily horoscope, which will be coming soon to the Queeby streaming service. Uh, hold on a sec. Let me just, uh, yeah, there we go. All right, let's just put it up where we see all the characters and the, uh, the title here. And, um, you know, I'm going to be very honest with you guys. This, um, this really does amaze me. Like, wow. It has been quite a long time. Since I've seen something this bad, like, oh my god. Like, I I'm sure, like, the show creators and stuff like that, they probably mean well with this show. But really, what I'm seeing, it's like, oh my god. Like, I, I don't know if I could even say this is finished. Like, that's the thing. It's like, this is bad to the point where I feel like this is a show that doesn't feel complete that they're not done with it. There's a lot of things that they need polishing, and yet they're just gonna go and release it on the streaming service. Oh boy, like, 
where do I begin with this? Where do I even begin? Okay, I, I think first off, I think the one thing we can go and start things off is state is, is to go and state the obvious. This looks like a complete BoJack Horseman ripoff. Like the aesthetic of it, the setting, the what they're trying to do with it, and essentially the whole tone of being like this adult animated series uh, featuring like these anthropomorphic animals where like it's basically the like a realistic animal head on a person's body and stuff. It's it pretty much has that whole aesthetic into it, and it's just. I, I feel like it really doesn't have a soul in itself. Like, okay, maybe I could be wrong. Maybe there's a lot more to it in the show, but really a lot of it just feels like it's just trying to be Bojack Horseman in terms of tone and in execution and especially in character design. Like, we all know that with Netflix, they really did a fantastic job with delivering these kinds of shows, like with um, with BoJack Horseman, and then there's also Tuca and Birdie is another great example, um, and then they dropped the ball on that, and then it got picked up by Adult Swim, but, you know, like, that's starting to be a little bit of a trend, where we see, like, the realistic animal heads on a person's body, and they kind of live, like, this sitcom-y, uh, real-life, uh, slice-of-life kind of thing in an adult animated series. And this is just, it, it feels so, like, it doesn't really have a soul of its own. It's just trying to emulate what someone else has done. And the weirdest thing from it is that, technically, this show is brought to us by BoJack Horseman himself. Like, one of the executive producers of this is Will Arnett. And really, like, I don't know what his goal is. I don't know, like, if this is what he really wants to do, like, have his own BoJack Horseman, like, after the show was complete, he wants to try to continue in another way, and this is the only way he would do it, is to make his own BoJack, his own BoJack Horseman with your daily horoscope, but it's just, looking at this, it's just, yeah, boy, man, it's just, it's, I don't know, like, already the tone is already putting me in a pretty sour mood where, like I like it doesn't put it doesn't give me a lot of faith in this, and then there is also another factor that makes this very very unsettling, and that is the animation. Oh man, the animation! I, like there's a part of me that doesn't really want to go after it because it might seem a bit incomplete. But let me tell you about the animation. You you know what this reminds me of? You know what this animation in particular makes me think of? Okay, I don't know the name of it. If you know what it is, you feel free to shout it out. But you know what this reminds me of? This is just like those social media commercials. Like, this is one of those little ads that you would often find popping up, like either on Facebook or on Twitter or whatever, where you would have these family guy looking characters where they would go and have this medieval setting and they always use the same joke. It's like, if you're good at this game, then hot ladies want to go and sleep with you. Like, they always have that same kind of dumb, stupid sex joke where it's almost like it's trying to emulate Family Guy in terms of its tone and especially with the character designs. And it always has that cheap-looking animation where it, it, it has that very budgeted animation as they would go along. And, um... This is on, and, and, and like, maybe you probably know what I'm talking about, but that kind of animation from those commercials, that's what I think of with your daily horoscope. Like, especially, like, at the opening, like, I, I, I won't put in the audio of it, but, like, you just look at this. Like, you look at the animation. Like, you see how the horse guy turns? Like, I'll, I'll just show you again. Like, take a look at the horse guy. It's just like, that's not even a few frames. Like, that that's barely, like, you might as well just go immediately switch it. It's just, it feels so clunky. It feels awkward. It doesn't feel complete. And on top of that, here, let me put it on again with the audio, and you'll see something else that's also very problematic. Well, yeah, duh. That's important. Hey, does anyone happen to know how a bill gets passed in the Senate? I have no idea. That lip sync. Actually, why why am I even saying it? Why am I even saying that lip sync? There's no such thing as lip syncing in here. 
Like, oh my god, even an like even animes know how to do better lip sync than this, and their mouths only go up and down. Well, okay, most of them. I'm not gonna say all of them, but you know, like you, you get the general idea of what I mean. But this here, it's like this is horrible. This is horrible. It's like it, it's barely even trying here. Like here's another example with uh with the Ares character. It drive an eco-friendly car would be a Tesla, the expensive one, not the peasant one. That is bad, man. Like this is such an incomplete. Like it really does feel like such an incomplete project. This feels like a last minute slapped in together project. And I mean, yeah, like uh, maybe I'm going a little too harsh on this, but wow, is this the best? Like, honestly, I, I look at this and I feel like, is this really the best you can do? Is this really the best that you could put out, especially from something like uh, apparently like not just from Will Arnett, but also from um, ATTN, which technically is a pretty prominent company as well. Like, do you guys not have the budget to produce, like, a properly made animated series? And especially, uh, and especially considering it's from Queeby, it's like, is, is Jeffrey Katzenberg or any of the executives working on Queeby not giving out a, a lending hand to work on this animated series to give some kind of quality? Like, if you're gonna go, like, in the BoJack Horseman territory, then why not, like, at least give it some budget to make it look like BoJack Horseman at the very least? Now, I know that at this point, there are going to be some people that might want to call me out and say, Oh, come on, Animat. Like, maybe this is just a work in progress thing. Because the trailer was just recently released. You know, they, they just put out this trailer this week. And maybe, like, they still have a lot more things to work on. So, it's not going to be out for a long time. So, maybe I'm just going way too harsh on my first impression. Maybe you're right. Maybe that could be the case. But actually, you know what? No. Because you know when this thing is going to be coming out? You know when the release date of your daily horoscope is? Apparently, according to the official YouTube channel, it says, coming to Queeby, July 6th. July 6th, on Monday. And to give you a little context, I am recording this on July 4th. And we're on the Saturday, so it's literally just a few days away from when I'm recording this right now that this thing is going to be coming out. So basically, with this trailer, what you see is what you get with this kind of animation and all. This is honestly just baffling. On And actually, you know the saddest thing about this? You know what? what is the, the saddest thing about this whole project? It's not the quality, it's not the animation, it's not the voice acting, and it's not the fact that it is from people like Will Arnett and uh, Queeby and stuff like that. It's the fact that its premise is actually a pretty good idea. Like, think about it. It's a, 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 You got an animated series that's about the modern life of of astrology icons. You know, that in itself, like, it may sound a little bit vague, but in the right hands, that could actually work out very, very well. That could actually be a great idea that you can actually play around with horoscopes and astrology and the mythos of it all. That can actually work out beautifully. But in terms of the execution here, it is just... It's terrible. It destroys any form of potential that it has because it feels like a cheap knockoff of BoJack Horseman. Like, this is the kind of thing that people make memes out of. You know, it's like, Mommy, can I have BoJack Horseman? And then the mom says, We have BoJack Horseman at home, and this is BoJack Horseman at home. So, overall, th this, this Your Daily Horoscope thing is just... Wow, this is embarrassing. I think that's the best way to put it. it honestly, I, I can't help but feel completely embarrassed for the kind of quality that they are presenting here in what's supposed to be uh, a major streaming service that should be in competition with like many of the big ones, like should be up against like Netflix and Disney Plus and HBO Max and stuff like that. But with Queeby, it's just like, is this really the best you can do? And especially, like, this is from Jeffrey Katzenberg's streaming service. Like, th this is the guy who went from, like, some of the most well-known and beloved animated series in recent years, like Shrek, Kung Fu Panda, Madagascar, How to Train Your Dragon, and then Stupa's Low, 
as releasing this on his platform. Like, really? Th th this is the best you can do. It's just, th this is the best. You All you got is this BoJack Horseman ripoff because you're so desperate to have a BoJack Horseman show for your streaming service just so you could be like Netflix. You know, honestly, it's stuff like this why people make fun of Queeby. It's stuff like this why people say that Queeby is a massive failure. It's stuff like this why it shocks people why Queeby is not dead yet. And wow, man, I'm, I'm just... I, 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 I can't help but say, like, I feel sorry for, for this show. Like, holy crap. It, it's rare that I would feel this way, but... Honestly, I feel bad for this show being this terrible. Because again, it does have a very promising concept and a very fascinating concept that I do hope that someone else can try as well and maybe improve on it to create their own animated series or animated movie or something with astrology characters. That would actually be great. But this right here, nah, this this thing is like dead in the water, man. I, I, this is, man, this hurts to watch. Now, with that said, I would like to go into the chat wall, and I would like to ask you all, what are your thoughts on your daily horoscope? Do you, like, do you disagree with me, and you think that there might be more to it, that there could be some potential to this show, and it could actually turn out to be good? Or do you agree with me and think that this thing is, like, dead in the water, and it's just a pure embarrassment? Let me know what you think now. <clears throat> Alright, let's see here. This show is going to be as bad as I can see it as a BoJack Horseman ripoff mixed with Go Animate uh, v uh, Beyond. Beyond? Yeah, I think it's Beyond. Uh, heck, this has the kind of animation where you swear this was animated in the latter software. Also, the designs uh, scarily remind me of the Seth MacFarlane shows uh, to the point where I can even consider this a poor man's family guy. Uh, even the way they move is horrible and unfinished. I feel like it belongs more as a YouTube series than a legitimate uh, series on a streaming service like Queeby. Exactly! You know, honestly, if this were like a, its own independent series on YouTube, then I wouldn't necessarily be as harsh on it. But the thing is, is that this has some major stars behind it. And also, this ha the, like this would be available on a major streaming service. So really, this has no excuse to look this awful. Like, honestly, if you would put it up as its own YouTube thing then, may, like, honestly, I wouldn't be that harsh on it, and I would be a little bit more open to know how they would go and execute the concept of it. But, uh, honestly, with the kind of status that it has, it has no right to look this bad. It has no right to look this unfinished. Seriously. Like, like what the, what the hell? Like, what, what, like, why even have the Will Arnett name in there when it looks like he barely even did anything on it? I mean, maybe he did, but, oh boy, I, I don't know. Anyways, um, no way this is a real show. This has to be a trailer made by a troll. I mean, with its horrible jokes and absolutely laughable animation, this just has to be a fake trailer. Hell, Luigi Marinus has a reputation of making fake trailers. And uh, for those of you who don't know, Luigi Marinus uh, is often known to be a troll um, that would often pop up either on my channel, like in the comments section, or even in here. Like, he was a massive troublemaker. And no way am I bringing him back. Uh, anyways, uh, let's see here. Uh, but what do you expect from Queeby? I mean, this is the same streaming service that brings us Anna Kendrick going on a road trip with a sex doll. I'm sorry, what? That's a thing on Queeby? It's Anna Kendrick with a sex doll? I mean, does she use it? I mean... Use it for its purpose? I, I don't, I'm, you know what? No, I'm not going to ask any more questions. I, I don't know if I even want to know, but, you know, the sad thing is, is that, yes, this is a legitimate thing here. You know, this is, like, this is the official YouTube channel of Queeby, which, yeah, like, I, I guess I could officially say that my YouTube channel has more subscribers than freaking, uh, than, than, a, than an entire streaming service by a billionaire, so... So that's a thing. <laughs> it's, it's it's real. I don't know what else to say, man. <laughs> uh, anyways. 
Well, your daily horoscope looks like one of those really bad Fox adult animated shows or adult swim shows. Nothing but adult versions of poop and fart jokes that look awful. And I haven't said that in forever. Definitely don't check this out. It's not clever in the slightest. Yeah, I don't know, man. Even like, even the Fox shows at its worst can look way better than this. The problem is with this show is that it has no standards. It's like it completely lost the standards and the, the things that look so bad, like they, they might as well be considered unfinished. That's the real issue with this one. All right, let's see what else do we got here. Uh, wow, this looks lazy. Maybe not 12 ounce mouse levels of lazy, but still. Even if the budget was low, that's not an excuse for looking cheap. This looks like it could be a YouTube series, but there are YouTube budgeted animations that look more professional, like uh, Mystery Skull's music video to give one example. Eh, but, but even at that though, dude, even at that, that could be debatable because now the standards has raised uh, a lot higher, especially by Vivzy Pop, uh, who brought out shows like uh, Has Been Hotel and Hell of a Boss. Like that, like those series right there did set a brand new standard for animated shows produced for YouTube. So even at that, like maybe if it's maybe if this thing is like its own, in, if it's like its own small independent project, maybe. But again, we're not dealing with a little YouTube series from like a small up and coming uh, aspiring animator. This is for a major streaming service with a major celebrity behind it. So, honestly, this, again, this has no excuse for being this terrible. Okay, so I'll go and read um, one more thing before we're going to jump into the next story. Uh, funny enough, I once came up with an idea of a show or video game based on horoscope characters, and it was also inspired by Bojack Horseman, except they were more action and sci-fi fantasy based. I dropped it because uh, it never stood fresh in my head, and I was more interested in trying to adapt the Chinese Zodiac in either a game or TV show. Looking at this, sheesh. Uh, I take back what I said about Goodbye Volcano High. Uh, say what you will about the writer, but at least I see more talent uh, in that than this. Uh, actually, I'll go and read one more, uh, one more thing. Actually, like this one has a pretty interesting comment. What can I even say about the animation that everyone else hasn't said yet? It's so bad that it makes Brickleberry look like freaking Primal. And uh, just hearing how the Capricorn character says Mimi is just making my inner Capricorn cringe. Count me out. Yeah, you, you said it, dude. You said it, dude. Unfortunately, that's the thing. It's, uh, it's just a BoJack Horseman ripoff. And if you guys are interested in uh, checking it out, if you want to see how bad this thing can truly be, then all you have to do is just uh, wait until Monday on July 6th when it will be available on Queeby. Okay, now that we got that out of the way, I think we need a little bit of a refresher. Maybe check out something else that will feel much better. That, you know, like uh, something that would be much more of an improvement than this. And I do have something in mind. It's just something that I've kind of stumbled upon and it looks very interesting to go and talk about. Now, I'm not necessarily saying that this thing is going to be a masterpiece, but it'll definitely be better than what we got with your daily horoscope. Uh, especially when it has some pretty fascinating ideas that um, might have some very strong potential. So with that said, let's go ahead and check out another trailer this time for the upcoming direct-to-DVD Scooby-Doo movie, Happy Halloween, Scooby-Doo. Let's check it out in three, two, one. And... hold on. There we go. It's Halloween. It's me, Elvira, Mistress of the Dark. Join Scooby-Doo and the gang in their first Halloween movie mystery. Let's go, guys. Places ASAP. And they aren't just looking for treats. We got him! Excuse me! We don't know these guys! <laughs> a familiar villain. Dr. Jonathan Crane, an escapee from Arkham Asylum. With a few tricks up his sleeve. I am plunging this entire town into unmitigated terror. You get him! No, you get him! A fearsome new monster. <laughs> double giddy up on the double. Now it's up to brain power. Bill Nye. Velma. 
my friend. I got you something. To put this mystery to the test. Welcome to the future of mystery solving. Keepers! It's the Creepers! Hang on, Die Riders. They're getting geared up. What do we know about these jack-o'-lanterns? To unmask the truth. Silly, your pants right off your butt. Zoinks! <laughs> Orange! Freaky! Aggressive drivers! Light them up, Mr. Nye! <laughs> They're not going down without a fright. We need to, like, squash every squash that we see! <laughs> Are you frightened yet? Run! <laughs> Halloween's turned upside down and inside out! Happy Halloween, Scooby-Doo! Whoa! Like that escalated fast! Look for it on digital and DVD. So that was Happy Halloween, Scooby-Doo! The next... Uh, animated Scooby-Doo movie that's going to be coming out on digital and on DVD. And kind of, you know, kind of surprising, actually, considering that we are talking about Scooby-Doo and um, often Scooby-Doo has been considered as a uh, light horror kind of, uh, or more like kitty horror type of franchise that only now, like after more than 50 years, does Scooby-Doo have like, a full-on Halloween movie. I'm sure he has a lot of, like, Halloween specials and stuff, but, like, this is the first time that, like, this is a movie that's fully dedicated to Halloween. And I I'm just gonna say right now, I know that, like, uh, like, what I'm about to say sounds like I'm gonna be very much hyping up, but, like, you gotta keep in mind that this is still a direct-to-DVD Scooby-Doo movie, and they often have a pretty strong reputation of having uh, having not so great standards. Like, you're not expecting something that is amazing. Like, they've never reached back to the levels of uh, Zombie Island, per se. And trust me, they have tried. They even tried to make a, a sequel not long ago. Uh, but with that said, though, you know, honestly, for a direct-to-DVD Scooby-Doo movie, this actually looks pretty interesting. I gotta say, like, I feel pretty down with many of the ideas that they have. And one thing that I will say that is actually quite a refresher is actually hearing the original cast come back. Like, after going through the, uh, the, the recent 2020 movie from Warner Animation Group, it's nice to hear uh, the original voice actors return to their regular roles. Like, we got Matthew, Lir Matthew Lillard back as Shaggy. We got Gray Griffin back as Daphne. Uh, we got Frank that's also doing uh, Fred on top of Scooby-Doo. Uh, Frank Welker, of course. And also uh, uh, Kate, uh, Kate McCusey returning as Velma Dinkley. And, uh, well, okay, maybe I might have said her name wrong. I, I do apologize if that would be the case. Uh, but we do have the original uh, recent cast back to play as the character. So that is a nice refresher. You know, that's a nice um, welcome compared to what we went through with um, the big Scooby-Doo movie with Scoob, per se. Um, so, you know, that's a nice thing, like, coming back, you know, that's a nice return coming back from that. But also, I gotta say, there is one thing for me that really does stand out with this movie uh, compared to the others. Now, I know this is kind of like uh, a tradition with Scooby-Doo, like they do this all the time, but in this case, it really is the special guest stars that really are an intriguing standout moment for this. Like, okay, I understand with uh, Elvira. Yeah, like, you're you're doing a Halloween special, so it's not necessarily that much of a, of a surprise that you are bringing back Elvira. And then there's also Bill Nye the Science Guy that they are bringing as well. Where, you know, which is actually pretty cool, and, you, you know, I, I could see this working out, especially when they, they introduce the concept of, like, um... You know, like, bringing in a new mystery machine, like this this sleek, futuristic-style mystery machine uh, to help out to go and solve uh, this big mystery that's going on 
during Halloween time. But, you know, if I could be very honest, uh, with the fact that they are bringing up uh, Bill Nye as a special guest star, what I would love to see is not the typical Bill Nye that you would think of, like, back in the 90s with his Disney show of, like, Bill Nye the Science Guy. Well, what I would like to see is if Bill Nye can be a special guest on, like, either another Scooby-Doo movie like this or on, like, the Scooby-Doo show. Like, Bill Nye... Of right now because Bill Nye of course is definitely making a comeback in the mainstream not because of a show but mainly because of his attitude where let's just say he went he's going a little bit more mature with his approach where he's basically fed up with conservative uh, with a uh, conservative stupidity and is pr basically flat out saying that climate change is real coronavirus is real and you must wear a mask and if you're not going to do these things if you're going to if you're going to think that science are not facts then i'm gonna kick your ass that's basically the new ideology of bill nye like he's had enough of people's stupidity on the internet and he's just laying down the facts and if you're not going to do it he'll teach you a lesson one way or another that that would actually be very hilarious to see that bill nye in a scooby-doo movie Movie or something like that just out of place like everybody's keeping it g-rated except for bill nye and it's like you know like i, I see as they find out like who who the uh, villain is by unmasking them like you just see bill nye is just like i know you you're a climate change denier i could finally have my moment to kick your ass bud say climate change is real say climate change is real <laughs> Also, wear a mask, you son of a bitch! <laughs> oh, man. Uh, but, yeah, honestly, but for real, though, I would say, like, these special guest stars, you know, like, yeah, it's kind of typical that they would be there, but it is uh, nice to see them be on this. But probably the standout one, the one that I find to be the most fascinating uh, in terms of who they got as a special guest in here is uh, not necessarily a real person, but uh, the villain of this, which apparently is um, Scarecrow. Like, they, you know, they don't go around it. Like, they just flat out say that this is full-on Dr. Jonathan Crane, who is also known as Scarecrow and an escapee from Arkham Asylum. This is the same Scarecrow that is also uh, the Batman villain. And, and, you know, I find that to be really cool. And I know that... Like, in the past, they have, like, Scooby-Doo has collaborated a lot with Batman. Like, in the past, like, in Scooby-Doo's beginnings, like, when they would commonly have special guest stars, there were a few times when Batman would also appear. And even recently, there have been uh, some episodes, or even, I, I think, like, maybe a movie or two, where Scooby did collaborate with Batman. So, but in this case here, like... This is a show where we don't necessarily have Batman appear, or we don't have Batman appear that we know yet. But, they do have a Batman villain, and it's just him. And you know, I, I do actually find that to be very cool, because, like, now they're just casually insinuating that the world of Scooby-Doo is in the same world as Batman. That technically, Scooby-Doo can be a legitimate uh, DC character. And you know, you know, honestly, that would actually be a very fascinating direction that they could take. Like, if they want to reboot the DC Cinematic Universe, then just add it, just include Scoob. Like, just include Scooby-Doo and the gang. Like, ju just do that. See what happens. But honestly, in this case here, I find it actually very cool. And especially when you think, like, technically, like, if you're thinking about a Halloween villain, then Scarecrow would definitely be one of the top people up there. Like, this is a guy who, like, whose weapon is basically nightmares and stuff like that. So, honestly, it, it, it's actually a great... I, I find that to be such a great idea with what he can do, um, like, with his powers outside of, like, fighting Batman and scuff, stuff like that and putting it onto Scooby-Doo. So, w what I'm trying to say with this is that, yes, I am highly aware that this is a directed DVD Scooby-Doo movie and maybe the standards are not necessarily going to be all that high, but I will say, by Scooby-Doo, by direct-to-DVD Scooby-Doo standards, 
this is actually pretty cool, and I do like many of the ideas that they are bringing up, especially with having Scarecrow as the main villain of this, uh, of this episode, or may maybe it's not Scarecrow, maybe it's gonna be a little bit more, but featuring Scarecrow from Batman as a legitimate villain, uh, and then we also got other special guest stars like Elvira, and then you got Bill Nye, and, and like, they do often show, like, some pretty cool moments, like, right at the end, where you'll see, like, the characters... Uh, like fighting back and stuff like that uh like right here like you, you see like all the characters coming together like all the characters together like trying to fight the pumpkins and stuff like that and i don't know if it's either just me or like daphne does look pretty badass and oh my god i actually just noticed that like daphne and elvira just switched clothing i don't know the context of that but i think it is worth mentioning that we see in this scene which probably looks like the climax but we, for some reason, the, Daphne and Elvira has switched clothes. Take your imagination wherever you want with that logic, but, or with that knowledge, but I'm just pointing it out. I'm just laying it out there. But yeah, um, no, honestly, this could have some potential and who knows, maybe this could actually work out. This could actually end up becoming one of the better direct-to-DVD Scooby-Doo movies. Um, it doesn't look like there is an official release date as of yet, but chances are, um, considering it is a Halloween movie, I wouldn't be surprised if we're going to be expecting this maybe sometime either in September or October. So that's just something, uh, to point out just in case. All right. So with that said, oh, and, uh, one more thing, actually, uh, someone did mention Actually, the um, the director of this, that's almost one thing that I almost forgot. And some people might be, like, why there are some people that are pretty excited about this. Uh, a lot of people are also mentioning about the director of uh, this particular Scooby-Doo movie, which you might find to actually be a familiar name. And it's actually Maxwell Adams, who you may know as the creator of The Grim Adventures of Billy and Mandy. So I know there's a lot of people that might feel pretty nostalgic for Maxwell Adams and his past projects and who knows, maybe like some of, you know, maybe some of the quality that he put onto that show can also apply into here. And I will say right now, like there have been some pretty funny moments where you do see a bit of that humor uh, onto it, especially with Shaggy and Scooby-Doo. Um, I, I will admit like at the beginning, this is actually pretty funny. Um, like right over here, like when we first see uh, Scarecrow emerging. Like, this joke is actually pretty funny. Excuse me! We don't know these guys! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then there's also this, like, where we see Shaggy using Scooby-Doo as a gun where Scooby is just shooting out candy from his mouth. It's almost like Spongebob-esque type of humor, or it's, it's the kind of gag that, um, you would expect from, like, Billy and Mandy, so... Maybe, maybe there could be something. So yeah, overall, there's a lot of promise and there's a lot of potential. You got Batman Scarecrow as the villain. You got special guest stars like Elvira and Bill Nye. Uh, and also you got Maxwell Adams as the director, the creator of The Grim Adventures of Billy and Andy. So yeah, there's pretty much all that. Okay, now with that said, I would like to know from you, what are your thoughts from the trailer that you have seen in Happy Halloween Scooby-Doo. Are you excited to go and check this one out? Are you a little doubtful about it? Do you think it's not that good? Do you think it's as bad as what we saw with your daily horoscope? Let me know what you think. Okay, let's see now. <clears throat> um, uh, let's see, what, what, do, what do we got? Uh, I just have one thing, uh, about this movie. You know those jack-o'-lantern monsters? For some reason, they remind me of the jack-o'-lanterns from the Billy and Mandy Halloween special that are also monsters. Uh, do, uh, does it mean that, does this mean that Billy and Mandy are in the same universe as well as Scoob and Batman? Also, which is hotter, Daphne or Elvira? Well, I mean, oof. Oh, man, buddy. Can't put me, you, you, you can't just put me... Uh, in that spot like oh crap uh, honestly like uh, man that that is a good question i mean like uh, if i would have a choice like okay like we are talking about attractiveness and you know what honestly for me 
Like, I gotta, like, honestly, they, like, they're both attractive in their own unique way, I, I, I gotta say. Like, they, they have their own unique style of uh, attractiveness with Daphne and Elvira, you, you know? So, I would say it's kind of a tie, but for different reasons. But, you know, for me, if I would have a choice, like, if I would go out with either Elvira or Daphne, I would still definitely go with Daphne, mainly because Daphne is more closer to my age than Elvira, who is, like, much older but then again, if Daphne, but technically some people might say like, oh, well, Daphne is a teenager. She's 16. She's underage. Well, if she is underage, well, then I would have no choice, but then I'll go with Elvira, you know, <laughs> like, I hope she likes younger guys. <laughs> okay. Anyways, um, uh, what else do we got here? Uh, wow. Talk about epic. I mean, Scarecrow from Batman, Elvira, Bill Nye, the science guy, a sleeker mystery machine, and a crazy pumpkin monster. This is going to be freaking epic. Oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Like, as I said before, maybe the execution might not be much, but my God, does this have a lot of promise. And also, going back to what you mentioned before, like, um, the fact that we got these pumpkin monsters, honestly, that would be amazing. Oh, maybe, like, honestly, I'm going to make a prediction, and it's strongly possible that it could happen because like you got to keep in mind like Billy and Mandy is a Cartoon Network show if they would have a cameo in this that would actually just really make it perfect there oh my god you know I wouldn't be surprised if we end up having like some kind of cameo from either Grimm himself or from Billy and Mandy I just hope that does happen like I know like maybe that's just wishful thinking because it is uh Maxwell Adams being uh the director here but i don't know i hope that he can cleverly find a way to put in that little easter egg uh let's see here i'm very interested in this film the ideas are very fitting especially for scooby-doo and the fact that maxwell adams is the director is interesting and in my opinion uh i feel like this could be one of the better directed dvd scooby-doo films uh and it is great to see scooby-doo is going in a halloween direction with with it since the closest they they have ever got to something extremely dark with uh with mystery incorporated uh so i am curious Oh, well, okay. No, I'm not expecting anything dark. Like, this is still, like, in the spoopy level. Like, this isn't going, like, in the dark direction like what we saw with uh, Zombie Island. So, like, th th like there, I'm not expecting anything actually scary in this. Like, this is all just spoopy fun. Even if they would have Scarecrow in this. Um, oh, let's see. What else do we got here? Uh... I know that Scooby-Doo likes to do crossovers nowadays, but who would have thought we are getting Elvira Scarecrow... Oh, wait, did I just... Oh, no, I didn't read that one. Uh, Scarecrow and Bill Nye the Science Guy in the same movie. Though, to be honest, even as someone who likes Scooby-Doo, this doesn't really interest me right now. Also, Scooby-Doo's first Halloween movie mystery? Did everyone forget about Scooby-Doo and the Goblin King? I'll have to say yes. <laughs> Even I don't know about Goblin King, so I, I, I don't know. Oh, uh, let's see. All right, I'll go and read. Uh, I'll read two more, and then we're gonna move on to the next story. Uh, I gotta say, I wasn't expecting that. 2020 seems to be an interesting year for Scooby Dubert, especially with how insane Scoob was. Uh, I I'll likely check this out as long as they don't pause for five minutes to talk about how Simon Cowell is a major meanie head. Uh, also, with Bill Nye appearing, can Shaggy please say, Like science rules, man! Um... Actually, hold on a sec. No, Shaggy can't really say that. You're thinking of the wrong science guy. Like, maybe Shaggy will say that if they got Adam... Uh, I was about to say Adam Driver. Uh, if they would get Adam Savage as a special guest, then you then you can have Sa Shaggy come in and go say something like science rules. <laughs> All right. So, we, we just need to make sure that we don't get our TV scientists uh, mixed up, you know? Uh, let's see. One more. Uh, let's see, what do we have, uh, here? One major thing, this is exciting, even as something from Scooby-Doo, one major thing about this that could be a sequel to their Batman and the Brave and the Bold movie they did a while ago, if possible, they are continuing afterwards what happened after, after it. Overall, this is pretty much exciting and maybe be better than, sadly, Scoob. Yeah, you, you know, that, yeah, that, that could be the sad reality, I mean, like, I'm not going to set my expectations high because, once again, this is a direct-to-DVD movie. But still, I really do like the, the, the concepts and the ideas that they are bringing up. I feel like, on that level, they really got it top-notch. 
All right, so I think that will do it with the trailers, and it is now time that we are going to jump onto the stories. Yes, we do have some new stories that we got to go and cover. And with the first story that I have, we're going to be talking about um, a bit of a cinematic comeback of a few certain characters. Because these guys have been on the big screen a few times in many different variations, but now they will have another shot at it. But this time, with a few unexpected allies. And who I am talking about is regarding the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Yes, they are going to be coming back to the big screen in CGI, another computer animated Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles movie. But what is it about this one that's going to be more different than the others? Well, for that one, it's actually going to be regarding the other studio that they are going to be collaborating with. Because not only will Nickelodeon help out into rebooting TMNT onto the big screen, but at the same time, they also got... Point Grey Pictures, the company that is owned by James Weaver, Evan Goldberg, and Seth Rogen. Yes, Seth Rogen will actually be a part of this Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles movie. Now, keep in mind, though, I would like to go and emphasize that we do not have a confirmation as of yet regarding any of the cast. So we don't know if Seth Rogen will actually be involved either as a voice or anything like that. So for now, we know that he's going to be an executive producer producer on this along with Evan and James but there's no confirmation if we know anything regarding the cast and who's going to play who but we do have a confirmation however on who's going to be working on the movie especially regarding the screenwriter and the director they already got that believe it or not where they have uh, Brendan O'Brien of Neighbors, Sorority Rising, and Mike and Dave Need Wedding Dates uh, to go and work on the screenplay, while Jeff Rowe is going to be directing the feature. And in case you don't know Jeff Rowe, uh, Jeff Rowe is the guy who wrote several episodes of Gravity Falls and is credited to be the director of Sony's upcoming animated feature, Connected. And by the way, we do have a few quote. Uh, I think only one quote, actually, uh, coming from Brian Robbins, the uh, president of uh, Kids and Family for Viacom CBS. Uh, and uh, reading from my source here on Deadline, it states here... <clears throat> Adding Seth Evan James's genius to the humor and action that's already an integral part of TMNT is going to make this a next level reinvention of the property. Uh, re yeah, yeah, okay, that's the right word. Uh, of the property, yes. I'm looking forward to see what they do, and I know that Ramsey Nato and her team are excited to take the Nick Animation Studio into another great direction with their first ever CG animated theatrical. And um, I don't know if we do have... Do we have another quote? No? Okay. So it's only from uh, Brian Robbins. But yes, essentially, this is the big thing. is the fact that they're going to be rebooting Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles for the big screen. And this time, they're going to get the people at Point Grey to go and help out. Now, uh, there is also another thing I really want to go and clarify on this. Is the fact that this is going to be its own separate thing from uh, what's already established on television. Like, we already know they went through the CG animated series. That's already done. But right now, they currently have the rise of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. And for that show, that still remained to be its own thing. And on top of that, uh, they are already in the works with Netflix to go and create a movie for that show. So that's going to be... So with this one in particular, with the CG theatrical movie, that's going to be a different thing compared to that series in particular. Now, I'm going to be very honest with this news right here. Um, even if they would have Point Grey attached to it, that they would have people like Seth Rogen, Evan Goldberg, and James Weaver in charge, where they're going to be the producers and they're going to help out to work on this Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles movie... There is honestly still a little bit of that part of me that does feel a bit doubtful. Because say what you will about the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles franchise. Yeah, they're definitely great. They are definitely pop culture icons. But they don't often have good luck with movies though. Like yes, they, they had the first film which was a major hit and a lot of people love it and have fond nostalgic memories to this day. Like the first one uh, was top notch for many people. 
There is the second one that was not as good, but definitely has a very prominent cult following, especially with that Vanilla Ice number. But then following afterwards, yeah, that's where, um, that's where TMNT really did drop the ball in terms of their movies. Like following afterwards with, uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 3, uh, then you got the, uh, computer animated film from 2007 from Weinstein, uh, then you also got um, the two recent films from uh, Michael Bay, uh, which I believe, I, I think it's either just Platinum Dunes or Michael Bay actually produced uh, the more recent Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles movie where they try to make like this big block, uh, big budgeted blockbuster live action CGI hybrid kind of film. Like they would try to go and uh, do that. Okay, and some people are correcting me that it's not really Michael Bl uh, Michael Bay. Uh, it's more just a, a Platinum Dunes property. So it's a little bit like what they did before with uh, Dora the Explorer. Okay, I, I gotcha, I gotcha. But yeah, like, w w with that said, you could tell that with TMNT, somehow they were having a hard time to try to adapt it onto the big screen to make like a full-fledged movie out of it. I mean, technically, there is one that I just realized that I did forget to mention, and that is regarding the uh, collab movie, the crossover with uh, Batman, where Nickelodeon and Warner Brothers Animation work together in order to make that direct-to-DVD movie. Um, I haven't heard the reception of it. I haven't heard what people said about it, so I can't really say... So, honestly, and, and of course, I haven't seen the movie myself, so I can't really say how that film went and if it is, like, better or worse than what we have gotten with stuff like TMNT3 or some of the recent Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles movies. But m my, my point is, the thing, the, like, the whole thing with adapting Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles is that often they would have some pretty bad luck and don't really know how to get that formula right. And especially w with the fact that they say that they want to make an all-computer animated Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles movie, it does give me a little bit of doubt, mainly because of what I have witnessed with the 2007 film. And in my opinion, that film was really not that great. It, it's honestly, the thing is, is that it's one of the worst things coming from Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, not because it's bad, because I could definitely agree that there are tons of things that are like far worse, like, uh, the, the, like, uh, many of like the musical live action Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles things where the guy's wearing like ma ma mascot heads and uh, you, you guys know what I mean. Like, the lot, the live tour, or like the Christmas, the holiday special thing, yeah, like those things are nightmares. But, but back to what I was talking about with the 2007 movie. Um, the the, the thing is with that one is that it, it's one of those that it's just bad because it's boring. It's not really interesting, and the quality is really not all that great. It's 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 easily one of the weaker things that did came out of uh teenage mutant ninja turtles and it's a uh, like and it honestly does feel like a low point maybe there are some that do disagree with me but i don't know for me it's like yeah i've definitely seen so much better so it does put a bit of a damp in my mood when hearing about this news because like i know that they've had a lot of bad experience with it but who knows maybe i could be wrong and maybe this is what like maybe this is what teenage mutant ninja turtles needs for a legitimate movie for the big screen like so, like they would have point gray in order to actually go and help them out that maybe people like james weaver seth rogan and evan goldberg would actually do know what to do with the franchise and how to actually go and make it fun now i know that there might be some people out there who are going to bring up other examples of uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles movies, uh, that are more connected to some of the shows, uh, you know, stuff like Turtles Forever, or even, like, what I mentioned with the upcoming rise of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles movie, but then again, like, they already have some additional help coming from the original series, so they have a connection, 
uh, to the show. They already got something to help them out in order to develop their movie. All they have to do is just expand from the concept that they have already created. But when it comes to reinventing the wheel, that is something that Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles often has uh, difficulty with uh, when it comes to movies like they, they could be fine with TV shows when they want to try to create a new interpretation of it but movies are often a bit of a weak point for TMNT and uh, like even after all these years they still have yet to really reach something that would be in the same standards as the first feature film that came out so honestly for me there's not necessarily a whole lot to mention about this but no, no, no. I, like, personally, I have a little bit of my doubts on this one, uh, but maybe this could be the thing that can actually make TMNT great on the big screen. Who knows? But, yeah, for now, I, I guess we'll have to wait and see, but I I'm not, I'm not holding my, like, honestly, I I'm not going to be expecting anything too great out of this, so... Eh, who, who knows? We don't have a release date yet. Technically, this project was just announced, so... Yeah, well, we'll, we'll see what happens, but I do, like, honestly, I do, however, uh, wish the best of luck to the people at Nickelodeon, to Point Grey, and especially to Brendan O'Brien and to Jeff Lowe to hopefully uh, bring some justice to TMNT and actually make a legitimately good computer-animated TMNT movie. Okay, so... Uh, with that said, I would like to go into the chat wall, and now I want to ask you all, what do you think about the news about, um, TMNT getting a reboot from Nickelodeon and Seth Rogen for the big screen? Is this something that you're excited about? Are you still highly doubtful? And especially if you are a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles fan, I really want to know what you think about this. I really want to know what would be your opinion regarding this subject. So let me know what you think. Okay, so uh, let's see what we got here. <clears throat> uh let's see hmm tempting i am curious to take a peek at it uh let's just say my history with the turtles is completely bonkers the first tmnt thing i saw uh was the 1997 live action show ninja turtles next mutation uh saw uh saw all the 1987 tv series episodes owned a lot of the games based on the 2003 turtles saw a bit of the 2012 show didn't mind rise of the teenage mutant ninja turtles and the michael bay produced movies love playing as them in injustice 2 and i giggled at parodies of it in animaniacs and yes even teen titans go okay uh let's see what else do we got here Honestly, I'm very mixed about it. On one hand, I'm pretty excited. I'm more of a casual fan of it, mostly familiar with Rise of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and the 2012 series. On the other hand, the brothers haven't had a good rep on movies ever since. And uh, come to a full CGI movie, remember the 2007 movie? I didn't really feel like, it, it didn't really feel like a TMNT movie. And is anyone really asking or demanding for this? Eh, not really, but then again, Nickelodeon is just trying hard to really capitalize on this, so, um, eh, who knows. Or maybe this is just something, like, maybe it's more Point Grey that wants to do it more so than Nickelodeon, and, like, like Seth Rogen and the gang tried to persuade Nickelodeon into trying to doing something like this, even if Nickelodeon already has um, Rise of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, so... Who knows at this point? But then again, to answer your question, though, um, uh, I don't think really anyone is demanding this. I don't think this necessarily needs to exist, but there must be someone in the higher ups that wanted it. So that could be the reason. Uh, let's see. As a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles fan, I am really excited that there will be another CG movie starring the heroes in a half shell. Plus, the fact that Seth Rogen is producing really sells it for me. I wonder if there will be a scene where the turtles smoke weed. Well, it depends on how edgy they want to be. It depends. I'm not going to say no, but then again, we will have to wait and see uh, how, f how far they want to push the envelope on this. Because technically, like, if you look back into the first movie that they have done, like, that was another one where they really did push the envelope as well. And it was very scandalous where I think it was Raphael or one of the other turtles, like, just random, like, had one scene that shouted out, like, Damn! like out of frustration like and that was considered like very scandalous at the time so who knows maybe 
I don't know, maybe Mikey might smoke a joint or something like that. He would be most likely to do so. Let's be honest, if there was going to be one turtle that's going to be smoking a weed... It, oh, smoking a weed. So I apologize for sounding a little too white there. Uh, but for if there's going to be someone who's going to be smoking weed, it's definitely going to be Mikey. Okay. Um, <clears throat> anyways, uh, what else do we got here? If we are getting another variation of the Ninja Turtles, um, one thing I will say is skip the origin story. Uh, in the same vein as Batman or Spider-Man, almost everybody knows how the characters were born. Like how we are tired of seeing Wayne and Uncle, uh, seeing the Waynes and Uncle Ben getting shot over and over. We don't need to drown. Uh, we don't need to drown baby turtles in ooze for the millionth time. Uh, that that is true. That 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 is also a story that like we keep hearing again and again and again. Um, let's see what do we got here. As a fan of Point Grey, I'm looking forward to it, and I and I hope for the and I hope the best of luck for the crew. I do question though how people would react to them making a more modern cartoon like Steven Universe or something like that. Ooh boy, if you're gonna take something like Steven Universe and try to make that like as a big CG movie, I don't know. I it's something I'm kind of scared to really think about. I don't know if if it's something like the cartoon community would really be ready for like regardless if it's like steven universe or adventure time or like even make like a full cg my little pony movie or something like that it's just like i don't i, I don't know if i i don't know if i would want to go on social media when those things would be announced i'm, I'm just gonna say that <laughs> okay uh, i'll go and read one more before we jump into the next story <clears throat> uh, let's see We'll just have to wait and see on this TMNT film produced by Seth Rogen and company. I could see this as a good thing as well. Uh, there are still plenty of ideas that the Turtles could do on their next adventure. I do love the Turtles, man. Hopefully for a PG-13 rating if they have the guts to do so. Well, you know what? It's actually pretty nice to see that the comments are a bit more optimistic, or at least more optimistic than I am. So, at least it will be worth something. So, again, let's hope for the best of luck for the people working on the film and, uh, Hopefully we will get a good TMNT movie. All right. Now for the next story that I have here. And we're going to still be staying in the realm of Viacom CBS. Because there is um, not one news, actually, but two. We're going to be talking about a two-in-one thing here. Because it's, it's interesting to talk about both of them at the same time. Because... It really does seem like Viacom CBS is planning something a little bit bigger than what they are letting on. They're not just reviving a couple of shows. They're plotting something a little bit bigger, and that's what I want to try to figure out in this. So with that said, let's go ahead and start things off with our first one here with Beavis and Butthead. Yes, folks. The icons are going to be coming back. Beavis and But uh, Viacom CBS has officially announced that they are going to be bringing back Beavis and Butthead to Comedy Central, along with bringing back the series creator Mike Judge and Three Arts Entertainment in order to go and bring them back to the latest generation. And on top of that, Mike Judge will be working on the show heavily, uh, not only being like a series creator and stuff like that, but will also be writing the show, producing the show, and also voicing both characters. And uh, by the way, like apparently they want to plan to make a big comeback with Beavis and Butthead, not only ordering not one, but two seasons of the revival, but also want to do a lot of spin-offs and even a lot of specials. Uh, to read from a quote here coming from uh, Viacom CBS's entertainment and youth group head, Chris McCarthy, Chris has stated... <clears throat> We are thrilled to be working with Mike Judge and the great team at Three Arts again as we double down on adult animation at Comedy Central. Beavis and Butthead were a defining voice of a generation, and we can't wait to watch as they navigate the treacherous waters of a world light years from their own. And on top of that, I just would like to also go and point out that technically this isn't the only Beavis and Butthead thing that's going to be coming back. 
we all know the cult classic uh, spinoff of Beavis and Butthead, Daria. Now, that show was already popular on its own, but apparently pretty soon they, they, they will have uh, a comeback of Daria where she's going to have a revival. And funny enough, not long ago, they actually announced a spinoff to that spinoff, uh, which is going to be Jody. So now Jody will actually have her own animated series as well to join in the ranks of Beavis and Butthead. But hold on a sec, folks. This was only one story to cover what I want to talk about here. There's also another one that did occur the day after they have revealed that they are bringing back both Beavis and Butthead. And what I'm talking about is the cult favorite, Clone High. Yes, folks, Clone High is going to be coming back along with many of the people who originally created the show. So Viacom CBS did reveal that on top of Beavis and Butthead, they are bringing back Clone High along with returning the series creators, Bill Lawrence, Phil Lord, and Chris Miller to go and be an executive producer, while Erica Rivinoja, who is a uh, South Park veteran uh, who wrote on the original series, she will be back as well as, a seri uh, as the showrunner. And uh, we also got another quote uh, from um, Chris uh, McCarthy as well, uh, where he states on this one that we are thrilled to reunite with Phil Lord, Chris Miller, and Bill Lawrence to reimagine this cult classic as we rapidly grow our portfolio of beloved and iconic adult animation series. So that's pretty much the big thing, is that one day after another, Viacom CBS decided to bring back two adult animated series with Clone High and Beavis and Butthead. Now, the big question that I have for this is just, why? Why is it that they are bringing them back? Now, I know that technically, this is good news all around. Like, a lot of people are really excited about this. I mean, like, you got Beavis and Butthead. These are, like, 90s icons. And a lot of people have great fond memories of Beavis and Butthead. And a lot of people do wonder, like, what would it be like if Beavis and Butthead would still make commentaries on our modern culture as well? Especially that we have grown nowadays, uh, especially in 2020, to be more of a woke culture. Especially with what's been happening with the coronavirus and also with the Black Lives Matter movement. And then you also got Clone High as well, where because of Phil Lord and Chris Miller's popularity, where as they were rising in the ranks of Hollywood... Um, their, their recognition where like we learn, where we learn about their origins with Clone High, that also got some popularity as well. And that ended up getting, gaining a, a lot more and more traction, even though that series was uh, very short lived. Unfortunately, I think it only had like one season and like 13 episodes and that was pretty much it, unfortunately. But a lot of people really did enjoy it and like they were revisiting the show and had a lot of great fun and uh, somehow had a little bit of a, a comeback in a sense um, after Lord and Miller really got their popularity boosted up thanks to movies that they have produced and other shows that they have produced like Lego Movie, Last Man on Earth and uh, uh, Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse. But again, going back to my big question, it really is a factor of why are they doing this? I feel like it is so much of a coincidence that they would go and bring those two back. And then it hit me. I thought about a news that we have talked about last week in the last episode of Animat's Crazy Cartoon Cast, where I look back at the, uh, the story where we talked about when the SpongeBob movie Sponge on the Run would end up not being released in theaters, but instead would go and be released uh, on premium video on demand first and then go exclusively on CBS All Access, Viacom CBS's streaming service. And on top of that, that they also announced at the same time that all the episodes of SpongeBob would be going on there as well as a way to reboot the streaming service. And that's where it makes so much sense now. The thing is, is that yes, they are bringing back these icons from so long ago and bring, you know, kind of making people's dreams come true of making like new episodes of stuff like Beavis and Butthead and Clone High. But this is, but I do believe, like maybe this is just a theory for me, but I personally do believe that this is a way to go and fully reboot 
the fran to re to fully reboot CBS All Access to make CBS All Access a legitimate competitor in the streaming war, so that it could probably be up in the ranks against stuff like uh, Netflix and Disney Plus and HBO Max and Amazon Prime and Hulu and all that kind of stuff. That they want to be a serious competitor and they want to go and take it seriously. But why specifically these ones? The, the, in fact, like you, you see Chris McCarthy stating that they really want to make more and more adult animated content. Like you'd think that they would already have a good amount as it is, but why would they really want to have that more? Uh, why, why would they want to go and have more of a serious push on it? And even though, like, maybe I could be wrong because of the fact that they say, like, especially for um, Beavis and Butthead, that they want to put it back onto, uh, they, they, they want to bring them back, but onto Comedy Central, since uh, MTV, MTV isn't really much of a thing anymore. Uh, but the thing is, the, the reason why that they are going with these shows in particular, why they really want to really boost up their adult animation content, it's mainly because of one thing that they have lost and that they have massively dropped the ball on South Park. Now, technically they didn't really lose South Park in general. You could still find it on Comedy Central and stuff like that. But what I mean is the fact that Viacom CBS did not end up getting the streaming rights to South Park. And that ended up getting in the hands of Warner Brothers, where they literally paid half a billion dollars so that that show could actually be featured onto HBO Max. Now, the big thing with that is that the, the reason why I say that this is such a major loss for Viacom CBS is because that would have been a massive deal breaker. Like having South Park would have been a major key factor to help sell their streaming service. Like think about it, like saying that it is the exclusive home uh, or, or the exclusive streaming home of South Park would have been like probably would have been a big deal breaker for many. You know, in, in, in the same ways that you look at uh, Disney Plus and how they're advertising The Simpsons or like maybe with HBO Max with some of the shows that they got, like the exclusive streaming home of uh, Sesame Street, of uh, Rick and Morty, of many uh, of like the Looney Tunes and, and many more shows like that or of uh, Friends. Like, the thing is with Viacom CBS, they don't necessarily have a whole lot. And South Park would have been a big help, but they ended up losing that instead. So they gotta go and make things up for it, especially in terms of their adult animation programming. Especially when that is making a massive comeback because of streaming services. And you see a lot of them really banking hard on that now. Uh, stuff like, especially you see Netflix really popularizing the whole trend, uh, thanks to Bo Jack Horseman, and then you got Hulu as well, which for a moment they had their time with Rick and Morty, and now they got uh, the other Justin Roiland show uh, for them. Uh, I kind of forgot, sorry, I apologize, but I, I forgot what the show was called, but, um, and then you would also have HBO Max as well, where they got a lot of the Adult Swim shows, and they own South Park, so... Uh, solar opposites yes thank you that's what i wanted to say uh, solar opposites but the thing is is that nowadays it, it's kind of like a key factor now to have adult animated shows be airing on your streaming service it's kind of like a key factor and that's why cbs all access is really going for that push right now and why they are like they're even willing to go and bring back stuff like beavis and butthead and to also bring back clone high and not only that but really capitalizing on uh, beavis and butthead as well like to bring back stuff like daria and uh to make a spin off of that as well with jody so really this is all a major plan in order to not just reboot their adult animation content but to really help out for the big picture in order to reboot their streaming service with CBS All Access to make that a bigger thing so that when it is time to fully present it, to fully uh, make that as a competitor, then they would have some content prepared for it. And that's the big goal that they want to do. At least that's what I think that they are doing. Now, keep in mind though, I am not saying that this is a bad thing at all. Like, I know some people might point point out to me and they might ask me like, 
So is this like a bad thing? Is Viacom CBS wrong for doing so? Absolutely not. I think this is more of a win for people. In fact, like when they announced Clone High was going to be coming back, I've seen so many tweets and so many replies where people are just flat out excited. And I mean... Oh man, during that day when they announced it, it is hard to go through uh, the internet, to go through social media without one person commenting or like quoting Gandhi going, Say what? So, yeah, overall, it is definitely a great thing and it's very beneficial to the fans and for the viewers as well to see these icons coming back and to see these cult favorites returning. But I was just trying to think about the whole big picture, trying to find like the purpose of this and what would make sense. And I feel like the best sense of it all is the fact that this is all a major strategy in order to fully reboot their streaming services. I mean, technically with Beavis and Butthead, yes, they're going to put that on television as well with Comedy Central. But really, this is mainly for their streaming service. They want, they want as much content as possible they want as much original content as possible in order to be prepared to make cbs all access a legitimate streaming competitor okay so with that said i would like to go into the chat wall and i would like to ask you all what do you think about the comeback of Beavis and Butthead and Clone High? Are you guys excited about this? Are you a little bit doubtful? Are you a little are you a little bit suspicious about the intentions of it? Let me know what you all think. All right, so let me let me just have this. Um, let's see now. Um I'm going to be honest here. I've never seen either of these shows, so I have nothing to say here. Maybe I'll get into them when they're released, but for now, I'll just wait and see. And besides, I kind of need to get CBS All Access because, uh, yeah, I'm not going to pirate Sponge on the run. Well, I mean, okay, well, you don't... Keep in mind, dude, you don't necessarily need to have CBS All Access for Sponge on the run. I mean, technically, there is also the premium video on demand that they're going to do beforehand. But if you want to go and check out Spongebob and get a whole bunch of other stuff at the same time, you could do that too. So I'm just letting, letting it out there. There are some other legal options as well. Uh, let's see. What else do we got here? Beavis and Butthead and Clone High returning is, def uh, is definitely... I am excited for the most... Uh, oh, it's definitely the thing I am excited the most for this week. One of my favorite shows on MTV ever. Hopefully they both succeed and hopefully make MTV return to animation. Uh, they made so many cartoons before and then suddenly stopped because of low ratings. Yeah, that is unfortunate, you know. It, it's just... Um, uh, that You know, it, it sucks when it happens. But I mean, like, that's, that's unfortunately show business for you. Okay, let's see. Well, this was unexpected. I'm very happy that CBS All Access is going to have these shows in the lineup. I haven't seen Beavis and Butthead or Clone High. I feel like this revival that CBS All Access needs, especially since the closest of a big property that Viacom has right now is just Star Trek and that's it. Um, actually, correction. Star Trek and Spongebob. The rest I have no freaking clue. Maybe, I don't know, if you want to watch... Maybe, maybe you watch it because you want to see more episodes of Survivor, but, uh... Uh, other than that, yeah, they that that's the big thing is that CBS All Access needs more properties. You can't just go with one and, and then go from there. You got to keep on going with a few more. Uh, let's see now. Uh, what else do we got? I'm not that interested in seeing either reboots, but I am pretty happy that these shows uh, would be told to a newer generation. I might give them uh, a chance sometime in the future, but for right now. I'm not that interested. No, oh, okay. <laughs> um, let's see. This is really interesting and even exciting. Uh, uh, even an exciting story for all three shows. I guess you're also adding in Jody on this, but okay. MTV has really dropped the ball these days for abandoning their entire adult animation library in favor of more reality shows. Uh, then again, those revivals wouldn't probably work for any cable network anyways, so streaming services is the best call. I wonder what other MTV cartoons they could uh, make another comeback next. Uh, maybe Aeon, Aeon Flux? Eh, who knows? I mean, they are planning to fully bring back their adult animation content, so I wouldn't say no, and I guess we'll have to really wait and see on that. I'll, I'll go and uh, read one more comment 
Uh, let's see what we got. As a big fan of Lord and Miller's works, I am glad that Clone High is being rebooted. I have yet to see it, but this might have mo this might have motivated me to watch the series. Uh, yeah, definitely. You you can actually. Um, I will say though that um, if you are going to uh, bring it, if you are going to watch it. I do think, like, correct me if I'm wrong, but I do believe that for now you can actually go and check out the episodes on YouTube. I mean, technically, like, some people could say that it would be pirating, but then again, if it's on YouTube, uh, then, it, then again, watching it wouldn't necessarily be, um, you know, it, it wouldn't necessarily count as, like, pirating and stuff like that because... I mean, it's YouTube, so uh, it, it's more the person uploading who is more at fault than it is, um, like, the viewer and stuff. But I think for now, if you do want to watch the episodes, I believe they are on YouTube right now. You could correct me if I'm wrong on that, but that could be an option. And, I mean, like, it is a cult favorite, so maybe maybe check it out. Like, definitely. Especially if you're a Lord and Miller fan. Like, je definitely go and see their origins, man. See where they all began. Like, see how they took their first steps in the in the animation business definitely you know it's definitely wor worth it all right it is now time that we shall go and conclude the story with the grand finale and with this one um this is going to be a little bit of a cautionary tale where you have to be aware of who you are interacting with and uh what kind of people whom they could turn out to be. Like, a good example of what I'm talking about is uh, whenever you would see people on social media, like, sometimes they, not, they might not be what they seem, despite probably creating a cultural phenomenon. Like, for example, uh, J.K. Rowling with uh, Harry Potter, where nowadays she has become uh, more and more and more insane. Like, if you thought she was pretty bad with the crazy comments or the crazy lore that she's creating with uh, with the Pottermore stuff, oh boy, <laughs> you don't want to know with what she's been saying about trans people. But anyways, um, what I'm going to be talking about here is another case like that, but... Um, it's very fascinating, and uh, and you got to keep in mind, I want to bring this up more as a cautionary tale. And what I am talking about is going to be regarding Scott Adams, the creator of Dilbert. Now, the thing with Scott Adams is that this week, he actually made a lot of buzz on social media due to the fact that he mentioned about why the cartoon based on his popular comic ended up getting cancelled. Where he claimed, and uh, I need to emphasize falsely claimed, that it got cancelled because he's white. So let me go and read you directly from his Twitter what he stated on this and he said, I lost my TV show for being white when UPN decided uh, t decided it would focus on an African-American audience, UPN being the channel that the Dilbert cartoon was on. Uh, that was the third job I lost for being white. The other two in corporate America, they told me directly. So that's what, what he said. However, there are many people, logically, would go and call him out on this that it is not true. In fact, they would actually go and state that not only is it not true, but... He full-on lied to people about the fact why it got cancelled. Because that's not what actually happened. What really did happen, in terms of why the Dilbert cartoon ended up getting cancelled, is because of the usual common reason why TV shows would end up getting cancelled and stuff, and that is low ratings. It did do pretty well on the first season, like it had a good run, and then by the second season, uh, they kind of switched time slots and from there, it ended up losing so many of its viewers where it ended up killing whatever chances of a third season. And some people might think like, okay, well, yeah, maybe that could be a logical reason, but it's hard to deny that coming from the person who did create Dilbert, like maybe there is some truth to it because this is the guy who kind of created the show and created the comics. So why would the explanation I state be more powerful than what he said? Well, here's the thing, though. The thing is, with what I said about the low ratings and stuff like that, the source I would have, and the source that many people use, is this interview from Ground Report, 
where they interviewed Scott Adams himself back in 2006. So let me go and read you from the ground report um, when he was asked about why was the Dilbert TV show canceled. In his own words, back in 2006, he has stated, <clears throat> It was on UPN, a network that few people watch. And because of some management screw-ups between the first and second season, the time slot kept changing and we lost our viewers. We were also scheduled to follow the worst TV show ever made, Shasta McNasty. On TV, your viewership is 75% determined by how many people watch the show before yours. That killed us. Okay, so ultimately, which one is it, Scott? Is it this one? Or is it because you're white? Because either way, there is one story where you are lying. And I think there's a very strong chance that it is this one. And, th and, and honestly, that's the big thing about uh, Scott Adams. Uh, since we are all animation people, I, I think the best way to put it is that Scott Adams is the comic strip equivalent of Butch Hardman. The dude is often recognized as a bit of an egomaniac where he wants to make every situation about himself and often would go and put up some crazy things on social media. Like he's stating here that, oh, I lost my cartoon because I'm white. That isn't the only thing that he would go and tweet that would just sound crazy. In fact, he does have a bit of a reputation of, um, uh, the best way I would put it is make right-wing nutjob social media posts. Now, this is not to say that this is the typical conservative things that makes conservatives look stupid. No, 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 no. That is far from the truth. But the thing is, is that whenever he would post a conservative thought or when he would speak to his conservative viewers, he would make posts that make it seem like it's a parody of a conservative account. It, it would seem like the kind of posts that people would make to make fun of Republicans and Trump supporters and the far right and stuff like that. And if you don't know what I mean, here's a great example I have. This is a tweet that he did that also got a bit of attention. Is when Scott Adams uh, made this post here saying that if Joe Biden wins the election at the end of 2020, there's a good chance you will be dead within the year. And he is speaking to his conservative viewers, by the way. He's not saying to everyone. And then he would follow up with a tweet saying, Republicans will be hunted. So basically, he's just trying to say that if Joe Biden wins the November election, then that means the Republicans are going to die because Democrats are going to hunt all the Republicans and they will hang their heads up in their walls like trophies. So just keep in mind, liberals, if you're if Joe Biden wins at, at the end of November, then you got to keep in mind, we still have to stay politically correct. We cannot use guns. Guns are bad. We need to get rid of the guns. Instead, we got to hunt Republicans down. We got to go and hunt Republicans with scythes. That's the new hunting tool we got to use. <laughs> okay, but, but in all seriousness, like you see the kind of, you, you see what I mean by a right wing nut job post. Like, th this is something that even conservatives with common sense would try to distance themselves from. Like, they would, like, Republicans with common sense would look at stuff what, of, of what Joe, of, Joe of, of what Scott Adams is saying, and they would be like, Yeah, no. Uh. <laughs> but yeah, like, you, you see what I mean. Like, and on top of that, Apparently, he does have a reputation as well for commonly doing this. This is not the only time. Apparently, every presidential election, he always does that. He always tries to frame it as if, like, if a Democrat wins, then it would mean the end of the of many lives of Republicans for some reason. And, and like, honestly, this is a little bit of a tradition that he would kind of do. So it's honestly no surprise. So at this point, a lot of people might be thinking that, okay, well, he's making a false statement me here about his Dilbert cartoon being canceled because he is white and stuff like that. Now there might be some people that might think that the dude is delusional, that he don't know what he doesn't know what he's talking about, the dude is an idiot. You know, like people would go and make these kinds of comments. But honestly looking deeper into it, looking the way that 
uh, looking at the way that Scott Adams would react, the way that he would tweet, and the way that he would interact on social media, I would disagree, honestly. He knows exactly what he was doing. He knows exactly what he is tweeting, he knows what he's saying, and he knows what he wants to do. And he knows for a fact that he's flat out lying. He knows that there's no way anyone could be can could be fired or could have their show be canceled just because they're white. He knows that there's no such thing as systemic discrimination or systemic racism against white people. He knows that it doesn't exist. So why would he so why would he go and post these things? Well, I'll tell you why. Scott Adams is a notorious clout chaser, a grifter, a notorious, a, a sociopathic attention seeker. The dude is doing it not to go and find justice or to seek truth, but he wants attention, regardless if it's positive or negative. And if you want some major proof, then look at the tweet itself, and you will see that this isn't just a regular tweet. This is actually a reply. This is actually a reply to Ahmed Best tweets that uh, it ended up going viral, where he shared this article from The Hollywood Reporter back in 2017, where it says, <clears throat> uh, Lena Dunham was 23 when she, sold, uh, when she sold girls to HBO with a page and a half long pitch without a character nor a plot in which Ahmed Best tweet states, uh, I have a master's degree in film and teach film at a top tier university, an over, an over 25 year professional career, and I walk into pitches with a fully realized Bible plot and several season arcs, and oftentimes told that it's not enough. But Lena Dunham, cool. Basically, the big thing Ahmed Best wants to go and prove is that um, there is a lot of racial discrimination everywhere and that systemic racism against people of color is more than real in fact even in hollywood there's a lot of uh, discrimination towards black people and often like executives favoring uh stuff done by white people more than black people would which is why like ahmed Bess is saying that this guy is a vet like a filmmaking veteran a full-on professional like and even if he has like all the stuff needed for a full-on series they would just tell him not enough but in the case of lena dunham a white 23 year old girl who can pretty much sell a show uh, sell a show with just a page and a long uh, a page and a half long pitch that doesn't even have characters or a plot, or anything like that, you could tell that there is definitely some systemic racism within Hollywood. And on top of that, like, a little bit of hypocrisy in Hollywood as well. Because you see them right now, like, all the major studios saying, uh, Black Lives Matter, and donating millions of dollars to nonprofit organizations. But it's not necessarily going to fully solve what is within the system. It, it, you know, it's not necessarily going to solve uh, the, the problem to go and hire more black people to actually work in movies and stuff like that. So with that said, though, it does raise the big question. What the fridge does Scott Adams tweet have to do with what Ahmed Bess is saying? Like, this just feels like completely random. And, and it almost feels like what, what Scott, or no, what it does feel like Scott Adams is just trying to steal the spotlight from Ahmed Best. It's like he's trying to, you know, he's trying to make it all about him instead of Ahmed Best. It's like, Rumble, I got my show canceled because I am white. Poor me. Please give me sympathy. You know, and, and that really does show what his intentions are. It may seem completely random, but he knows what he's doing. He's trying to steal attention from others and in the case here considering what Ahmed Bess is trying to show uh so, like he's trying to prove an example of systemic racism in Hollywood but Scott Adams wants to try to silence it and try to make it go 180 and try to say like no it's actually white people who are oppressed we are the oppressed race there's only racism against white people that exists Black people got it way better than whites. And, you know, it's like try to pull off that kind of bullcrap and stuff like that. And, like, you can even see it, like, 
following afterwards when there are so many people that call him out again and again, like Scott Adams, one after another, would keep on replying to those people who call him out, regardless of like if they point out the facts to him or whatever, like he would try to make some kind of snarky remark and stuff like that. And ultimately, this is what Scott Adams wants. This is what he wants to do. This is the attention that he wants to get. He's not trying to prove a point. He's not trying to seek justice. He's not trying to state facts or anything. He's just trying to get attention. And technically, I mean, like, you could say that it is working and, like, it's kind of hypocritical of me to try to cover the story because that would technically be what Scott Adams would want. But that's kind of the big thing to really emphasize. This is what he does. You know, this is the kind of mentality. He doesn't care what he is saying is true or not. In fact, he knows for a fact that he is lying. And there are many other examples of people like him that do so. Like, if you would ever go on YouTube YouTube and you find one of those anti-SJW people ranting about social justice warriors or forced diversity or feminism or whatever, they're pretty much the same thing with, with, with Scott Adams. They know that they're lying. They know that they're not telling the truth. And more often than not, they're more interested in trying to push a white nationalist agenda. And yes, like, in a way, this is actually a bit of a racist act in Scott Adams with what he's trying to do because he's trying to steal the thunder of Ahmed Best. He's trying to hide the problem of systemic racism and trying to hide the point of what he's trying to say, of what Ahmed Bess is trying to say with systemic racism. Trying to cover it and try to steal that attention to make it about him. To make the systemic racism issue not a problem and just make Scott Adams more of a distraction so that systemic racism can still thrive. Which is why this in itself, this tweet here, is a racist act. So ultimately, this is a cautionary tale. This is a warning about people like Scott Adams. And basically, the ultimate way to fight against Scott Adams in this case is just really, don't feed the trolls. Because that, that's all Scott Adams has become. Like, he knows for a fact that Dilbert has lost his popularity, like, ages ago. And in this case here... Like, people don't really care about Dilbert, so the best thing he can do in order to get attention, in order to get some notoriety, is just real, really to act like an internet troll. Like, I wouldn't be surprised if the, the whole Republican viewpoint that Scott Adam has is all just an act. That he only care that he cares more about himself and his own ego and his narcissism more so than his own beliefs, which is why he would go and make these kinds of tweets here. Like, that, that, that's essentially what clout chasers and what grifters are. They will say whatever crap they can, and they don't care about who they're taking down for the sake of getting attention, for the sake of getting likes, for the sake of getting uh, replies, and for the thrill of arguing people. Because this is what these, cr like, this is especially what these clout chasers love to do. They love to have fights, and they love to have debates. You might notice with a lot of these grifters, like, even though they don't care about the things that they say, they love to go and fight against people who disagree with them, even, like, they know that what their opponents are saying is pretty much 100% truth and 100% facts. You know that someone is a cloud chaser and uh, someone is a grifter when you would see people try to say, Come on, debate me, bro! Debate me, man! Come on, debate me! Come on, come on, you want to debate me? Come on, you're gonna, you want to lose? Yo, you're gonna lose if you don't debate me. Come on, debate me, man. Try to prove that you're right. But they're not interested in debating. They're, ra they're rather interested in bullying, harassing, and demeaning their opponents instead of actually proving their point. And this is exactly what Scott Adams is doing. For the most part, he's not really debating them. He's just attacking the person that they're replying. Like, like, like ba barely even proving his point about what he is talking about. So overall, Scott Adams is a notorious cloud chaser. And whenever you would see Scott Adams uh, replying to a tweet or when he's making a, a, an outlandish controversial statement on social media, then honestly, the best thing to do is just not bother. 
because the dude is seeking attention regardless if it's good or bad the dude is obviously he obviously has some kind of mental illness that makes him completely sociopathic and I, I can even say right now like I i'll even state that honestly his conservatism and stuff like that it's it's an act the dude doesn't care about like whoever wins or loses in the election he only cares about himself so honestly this is the big lesson that you should take from all this is just don't feed the trolls because this like Scott Adams is the prominent example of an internet troll and a clout chaser and a grifter and he and right now considering that people don't really care much about Dilbert this is all he is honestly this is this is his reputation now it's just a freaking troll on the internet so really who the fridge cares what he says so with that said uh, let us now go into the chat wall and I would like to ask you all, how do you feel about the whole Scott Adams situation? You know, like I know it's a pretty major subject in itself, but, uh, let me know what you think. Uh, let's see. Do I still have water? Oh, I do have a bit. Uh, let's see. Who is worse, Scott Adams or Ahmed Best? Uh, Scott Adams. There's no freaking context. There's no contest here, dude. I mean, like seriously <laughs> like yeah say what you will about Ahmed Best like Ahmed Best is the guy who did uh, Jar Jar Binks right I mean like yeah you could question his career but like if we're judging by who the person is individually then yeah there's no denying so Scott like regardless of how Ahmed Best is Scott Adams is like he's far worse no matter what okay so let's see now yeah okay he is so yeah so, yeah so yeah screw that you know what like and especially with Ahmed Best, I would just like to comment, like, I, I really do uh, feel scar- I, I really do feel sorry for the guy. Like, especially, like, the hell that he went through as Jar Jar Binks. Like, he didn't- he really did not deserve the hate. Like, yeah, sure, I understand, like, the criticisms against Jar Jar Binks, but for the guy himself, like, I really do feel sorry for him. And uh, I, I really do hope, like, his life has gone better. And I mean, like, saying that he is, like, uh- you know, with him saying that he has a master's degree in film and that he does teach in a top tier university, I hope his life is, uh, you know, I, I, I do hope the dude's life is, um, uh, pretty good, honestly. Okay. Anyway, I, I do wish him the best. This is basically what I want to say. All right. Anyways, back to the comments. Uh, let's see here. Scott Adams statement about his show being canceled because he's white is extremely dangerous. Even if people don't believe him, Others will and will use the false uh, experience as a means for their agenda. He's one of those people that would call B Black Lives Matter a terrorist organization. He's denying his privileges as a white man. His attention seeking is dangerous. He's going to end up hurting actual people of color if he hadn't already. Do you think Scott Adams does? The, the thing is, is that, that that's the real danger about this is that Scott Adams doesn't care. And the people who want to use him as an example of trying to attack Black Lives Matter, they're not going to care. And, and that's the thing with uh, stubbornness and ignorance is often like people underestimate the dangers of ignorance that people just don't care in general. I mean, why else do you think the United States is right now the epicenter of the coronavirus and that things are getting much worse right now for them? It's because of their own ignorance and stubbornness why the pandemic is on a massive rise in that country because many of these people don't care about using a mask, don't care about social distancing, or even like personal hygiene even. So that's the big, so, so that's kind of the big thing. People really do underestimate, uh, the, the dangers of ignorance and stubbornness. And it, it's a subject that I really do believe that should be more brought up, honestly. Uh, let's see. What else do we got here? Scott Adams saying something this bad. 2020 has honestly made me expect anything at this point. So I'm not even surprised about this. My sympathy goes out to Ahmed Best, uh, to be rejected like this and getting so much hate for playing Jar Jar Banks that he considered that he considered suicide must be really tough yeah that's exactly what i'm talking about you know this is exactly why i feel sorry for ahmed best because he did not deserve that kind of uh reputation he did not deserve that kind of treatment from the fans and it really goes to show like yeah a lot of people are very critical and a lot of people can seem like fanboy angry towards uh the new star wars trilogy but really 
it's it, it's unfortunately the behavior from Star Wars fans that has just never changed. You know, it's it, it, there's this toxicity uh, within the Star Wars community that's it's not towards everyone, but there's a lot of really bad people who believe in things that don't exist, like an SJW agenda or forced diversity that have remained in the Star Wars fan base for like decades. It's an issue that needs to be resolved within that community that they need to get rid of those people from that fan base and treat that kind of treatment as a crime. Uh, let's see now. Uh, what, what else do we have here? This is just wrong. He is one of those people who believe the Illuminati, uh, the Illuminati disparity bears and all those conspiracy theories, just like Donald Tr Trump. I can't believe this guy uh, who made Dilbert. I love the cartoon, uh, the Comedy Cent I'll, I'll Comedy Central when uh, it came out. He's more crazy uh, than Jim Davis, the guy who made Garfield, who believes that Garfield is solving world hunger and blind and all that stuff. Uh, yeah, and, and I'm gonna be very honest, you know, like, to tell you the truth, actually, um, like, it's been years since I've seen it, uh, since I've seen the show, but personally, I love the Dilbert series. I thought, I think, honestly, it's one of the most underrated shows out there. Now, again, it's been years since I've actually seen the show, but I do have the DVD, so I could, you know, I could revisit it whenever I want, but I remember loving the series and watching the episodes again and again. It was flat out hilarious and really clever. But then again, I think this is really the case where I have to separate the art from the artist, and I know that what Scott Adams is saying is a full-on lie, and that the dude is just a freaking ego psychotic egomaniac. So, yeah, no thanks, dude. <laughs> now, I guess, oh, I guess this is what uh, Danny Phantom and Fairly Odd Parent, uh, Fairly Odd Parents fans feel. <laughs> All right, I'll go and read uh, one more comment here. Uh, let's see. Um, oh great, another, uh, oh great, we got another one, or wait, hold on a sec, uh, do we have, uh, more of the, uh, other, no? Okay, never mind. Oh great, we got another once beloved creator become manipulative and hated, uh, hated, just like Butch Hardman and John Chris Velusi. Uh, by the way, something that's sort of the opposite happened with the Marvel Cinematic Universe, uh, Anthony Mackie, the actor, uh, for Falcon, has called out the crew behind the scenes of the Marvel Cinematic Universe for being almost completely white, but in my opinion, uh, should talent be more important than just your appearance? Not saying your appearance isn't important, but still. I mean, they're, like... I understand this whole conversation about like talent over representation and stuff like that. And you know, like, th you know, that, that is kind of like a whole debate in itself. Like you can make a whole out. I, I, I can make like a whole two hour, a two hour podcast episode just talking about that. But I, I think like the short answer about this is that, yeah, I mean, I understand the point of view of like talent over representation because like, yeah, talent is very important. But then again, that doesn't mean there aren't people of color out there that aren't as talented as well. You know, and, and like going to the, you know, going back to last week's, uh, it, to last week's issue about um, voice actors uh, stepping down from their black characters, people like Jenny Slade or Mike Henry or like uh, The Simpsons uh, no longer having white people voicing people of color. I'm like, yeah, sure. Like, in a way, like, I understand where they're going with it. Like, I understand both sides of the situation. But then again, that doesn't mean there's no, like, that doesn't mean you can't find a black person who can actually be a great Cleveland Brown. Or, there, like, that doesn't mean you can't find a black person that can make a great uh, Carl or Officer Lou or uh, some of the other black characters in The Simpsons that uh, escaped me. Oh, yeah, like, uh, Dr. Hibbert and The Judge. Like, I remember I saw on Facebook, I forgot the dude's name, but, oh my god, he did an amazing impression. Like, it, it was a black guy that did an amazing impression of all the black characters in The Simpsons. So, that, that that's basically my argument on that, is that, yes, there, yes, it is important. Like, I do get the point of view of talent over representation, but that doesn't mean representation can have that talent. It, it cannot have, that doesn't mean representation cannot have that talent, if you know what I mean. Okay, so at least we put that out there. 
And with that said, I think that should do it for this episode of Animat's Crazy Cartoon Cast. And man, what a fun-filled episode, and what a very informative episode as well. So I would like to cap this off by saying thank you all so much for watching, and thank you all so much for listening. And also special thanks to NeverEnding once again for sponsoring this episode. And until next time, see you later, dudes! Thank <laughs> you.